Welcome back to McClutchy Maths. My name is Natalie McClutchy and today we're going to be talking about how to draw a scatter plot by hand. This particular video is aimed at Year 10 students in the Australian Curriculum and it's also part of Year 12 General Maths in Queensland for Unit 3. This is part of an Applications of Statistics series that I'm doing, Part 2. In Part 1 we would have talked about bivariate data, correlation, causation, independent variables, dependent variables, what a scatter plot is. So if you haven't seen that video, it's a good idea to watch it first. In this particular video, we're going to focus on drawing scatter plots. Firstly, we're going to talk about what equipment we need. We're going to talk a little bit about explanatory and response variables. We're going to talk about what a line of best fit is. And then I'm going to show you how to draw a scatter plot and fit that line of best fit. We'll have a look at what we need to check when we're finished. And lastly, I'm going to show you some examples by students of some badly drawn scatter plots. Well, they weren't terrible, but there were some differences in there that needed to be fixed. OK, so let's start firstly by talking about our equipment. We need firstly a list of X and Y coordinates. These are going to form our points on our scatter plots. Now this might be provided to you or it might have been data you've collected yourself. Secondly, you're going to be needing some graph paper. Now if you're in an exam, you're probably being given a grid, but if you're actually drawing it by hand, you're going to need some graph paper to make sure that everything is done correctly to scale. You'll need a lead pencil or an erasable pen. Now, I do see students try and do it with pen and then they make mistakes and it ends up being quite a big mess. So that's why I recommend have something that you can erase in case you make mistakes or decide that your scale isn't correct. You need a ruler. Now you can use a lead ruler or a metal ruler, but I prefer a clear ruler and that enables me to see through it when I'm drawing my line of best fit to make sure I've got the right number of points in the right spaces. Okay, this is one for our year 12 students. So if you're in year 10, you can just buckle in and wait. It'll only take a few seconds. We're going to talk about explanatory and response variables. Now, an independent variable will be something we talked about in our last video. It's graphed on the x-axis. It's also got another name, the explanatory variable. And a good way to remember that is x for x-axis, explanatory has an x in it. Okay, dependent variable is graphed on the y-axis, and this is also called the response variable. So if we think about an independent variable, remember it doesn't necessarily cause what's happening on the y-axis, but when we think about equations of lines y equals mx plus c, when we substitute an x uh, variable into that equation, we get a y variable. So one will explain and one is the response or the result of using that equation. That's probably the best way that I can explain that. You just need to memorize the difference between the two, independent, explanatory, x-axis. Okay, let's talk a little bit about lines of best fit and then we'll get into actually drawing one. So a line of best fit is a straight line, if we're doing linear relationships, that's drawn through a scatter plot and it's used to describe that relationship between all the points. It's also called a trend line. That's something important to remember because if you're using technology such as Microsoft Excel, you won't find the words line of best fit anywhere in Excel. You'll find the words trend line. So that is basically a similar thing. They're not exactly the same, but we'll talk about that in a later video. Now, the thing about um, drawing a line of best fit by eye, or also called by drawing it by hand, is that it does rely on your personal judgment. So that can be a positive, but it can also be a negative. If you give two people the same set of data points, they'll probably draw that line of best fit a little bit differently, depending on where they see the data. Now, ideally, and this is a very important point, we want to make sure that roughly the same number of points is above the line as is below the line of best fit. It should be as close to equal as possible. Now, that can be tricky if you've got an odd number or depending on where this, the different points are spaced. But that's your aim is to try and get the same number above and below roughly. Ideally, we should also pass our line through at least two points. Now, sometimes you can see some points right up the top of all our scatter plot points that look like they could all join in a nice straight line together. And it's tempting to just pass through those points. But then that leaves virtually nothing above the line and almost everything else below the line. So that would not be a line of best fit, even though it's passing through a whole lot of points. One of the reasons we want to pass through a couple of points, at least two, is because then when we want to find the equation of the line um, using algebra, it gives us a pretty accurate result. So there are two 
main things we need to consider when we're drawing that line of best fit is similar balanced number of points above and below the line and passing through as many points as possible. Now, the, one of the purposes of actually drawing the line of best fit is that it can help us to make a more conclusive judgment about correlation. And we talked about correlation in the last video. So when you've got a bunch of points that look like they are fairly randomly scattered about and you've got that line passing through the middle, then we can make decisions about whether it's strong or moderate or weak correlation depending on how far away from that line all of the points are. Another thing that we can do with that line of best fit is create a model or an equation where we can use that equation of the line to make predictions. For example, we can make predictions um, using an x value from the x axis or a y value from the y axis. And we can make what's called interpolation predictions. And we'll talk about that a little bit more later. Another advantage of drawing our line of best fit by eye instead of by technology is that we can choose to either keep outliers involved or we can choose to disregard them and that's all at our discretion. However, if you're using technology and that piece of data is in there, the technology will use that to create the trend line. So it's important to remember that if you're seeing a very obvious outlier sitting all the way, you can actually just either ignore that or you can decide that you might want to adjust or skew your line accordingly. Now, if you're using a, um, a very simple method to create your equation of your line, the gradient and the y-intercept method. Make sure that you extend your line of best fit all the way to intercept the y-axis. That will help you to find your y-intercept really accurately and then all you have to find then is your gradient. We're not actually going to use that method um, in our videos, but um, we're going to use a different method in the next video to find that equation of the line. Today we're more focused on just drawing the scatter plot. So let's do a demonstration with an example. So here's the context of my example. I've got 15 house prices in Brisbane. They've been collected at random and I'm comparing those to house si to land size and to see if there's a relationship with the two variables. And typically what you would expect is that the bigger the block size, then the more expensive the price will be. And here are the prices of our houses. So for example, on the first one, we've got a block that's 800 square meters and it's sold for $515,000. Now what I'm going to do for you here is draw for you a scatter plot. But before I get started with my graph paper, I want to do a little bit of planning. So looking at my x-axis, I can see that my values for area start from 350 and they range all the way to 800. Now I could start at zero on the left hand side with my x-axis, but I don't want to start right at zero because what's going to happen if I do that is I'm going to end up with all of my points in that top right quadrant and they're going to be all quite close together um, because then it's going to be um, further spread out on each axis. So what I want to do is start my x-axis around the 300 mark and go all the way up to 850 or 800. So it's really important that before I just start randomly drawing my axes in, I need to have a bit of a think about where I'm going to start the axis and where I'm going to finish the axis. So I've thought about that. I'm going to start around the 300 mark, moving up to about 800, 850. On the y-axis, I can see that my range starts at around, let's have a look, around the 480 mark. So I'm going to start just a little bit before 480, maybe 475. And I'm going to go up in fives because I really only need to go up to as high as 515. So if I go up in fives, I'll have plenty of room on the y-axis. That's why you can see there's two dots, for example, drawn on that x-axis because that's me planning out how big I need to draw my line. So let's start by putting the animation on. And you can see in the animation to start with, I've drawn some breaks on the left-hand side. And I'm just going to stop that there and talk a little bit about what these breaks actually are. So remember I mentioned a few minutes ago that I wasn't going to start at zero. Now it's very important that I put these breaks in because that indicates that I'm not going to draw the numbers from zero through to 300. And if I didn't draw the break in, that would be implying that I was going up in 300s and then suddenly the scale changes to 50s. So that wouldn't be very accurate. So that's why I've got that break to indicate that I'm starting from 300 and going up in 50s all the way to 900. And I've also got a break on the y-axis as well. So let's have a look a little bit further as the animation continues to draw. Notice I've put in my titles on the bottom axis and 
there was one on the left hand axis on the y axis but as you can see down the bottom here I've actually put that there so that it fits in. I also put a title on but unfortunately it didn't get captured by the camera so um, always make sure you've got a title and axis labels and always a really good idea with those axis labels that you've got your units of measurement on there as well that they're not just numbers with the word area because it doesn't explain to somebody that we're talking about square meters and thousands of dollars. Now with the animation we're now drawing our dots in and it's really important that you just take your time with this make sure that you're doing it accurately. And now it comes time to draw that line of best fit. So remember we had 15 house prizes. Ideally, I'm going to want to draw through the middle and you're going to see in the remaining animation that I make a couple of moves and I start to draw it and then I stop and then I come back and I start to draw it again. That's really important that you use that clear ruler and look through it if you can to see where how many dots you've got above and how many below and you may even want to draw it very faintly in pencil first for example and then just do a check and if it's not right then do the correct one on top. So let's continue as we finish by drawing that line of best fit and there it is there we're checking now top and bottom to make sure that the number above and below is roughly correct so we've got one two three four five above and one two three four five six below and you can't quite see it there but we've actually passed through some more points above where the camera cut it out okay so that's how we draw a scatter plot now it's very important that when we've done, we don't just move to the next question in the exam. We need to check our work and there's a few things to look out for on a scatter plot. Firstly, make sure it's got a title. Now I know that my particular example, you couldn't see the title, but trust me, I did draw it. Okay, have you labeled your axes, including those units of measurement? This is something I find that even some of the best students forget to do because they're rushed and they're stressed. So make sure you just check these very fundamental things. Often, those axes labels could be worth up to a mark. So that's important to make sure we get that right. It's a good idea to count the number of dots matches the number of points that should have been plotted. So if you had to match, um, had to plot 15 points, just count your dots, make sure there's 15 there. It's always easy to forget one when you've got a lot to do. Also check that you've drawn your best fit line straight with a ruler. I know that seems pretty obvious, but you'd be surprised. Some people I've seen draw them freehand. Okay, it needs to pass through at least two points. So just make sure it's passing through two points and also count those number of points above and below. They should be similar. Notice in the previous video, there was um, six in one and seven on the other. That's fairly good. So um, that's kind of what we're aiming for. You certainly wouldn't want like five above and 10 below. That would be too much of a difference. Also, check that you've drawn your axis correctly and remember to show those axis breaks. And it's very important that you make sure your scaling on those axes remains consistent. So you don't just do 300, 350, 400, and then suddenly 500, and then 700. And we're certainly not matching those numbers on the x-axis identically to what's in our data points. I've seen that done as well, where a student has just simply put all the x values from the table along the bottom and then put the y values along. And that ends up very interesting looking. So we want to make sure that those axis is correctly scaled. Now let's have a quick look at some badly drawn scatter plots. Firstly, you look at this one and it looks pretty good. They've got their um, axis titles, they've got their breaks on the left hand side to show where everything is and it looks like it passes through the data quite nicely. Although it's not really hitting any points, which is a bit of a disappointment. It really should hit a couple of points. Also, we don't have a meaningful title and that's important. Sometimes you might think you've, you've, you've done the right thing. You've given it a title. This one's called Graph 1 and it's a hand-drawn scatter plot, obviously. But it actually should be some sort of title that gives me some information about the data set. So we know that they're measuring someone's sleeve lengths versus their trouser length, but who are the someones? What, what age are they? Where was the data collected from? That kind of information or when was the data collected should be included in your title as much as you possibly can. In this particular one we can see a very fundamental mistake that um, typically our seniors do after they've learned about time series is they join the dots on a scatter plot and that's an absolute no-no that is not a line of best fit. So if you're asked to draw a scatter plot never join the dots. Okay very important to remember. Okay this one here you can see that we've got all of the data bunch right up the top. Um, we've got some problems, we've got no axis breaks, 
and we should have what we've done here is started the data perhaps around um, 80 on the y-axis and maybe um, brought that whole scatter plot down that data is actually spread right across 1 to 10 so we really don't need an axis break on the x-axis but definitely would need one on the y-axis by spreading out that data a little bit more we can get a better idea of how that correlation looks at this point it looks like everything's very close to the line and it looks like it's quite strong correlation but that picture might change a little if we were able to zoom in on it so that's important to make sure you've got those axis breaks where you need them in this particular graph we've got roughly about the same number of points above and below the line so not bad we've got titles we've got axis titles but notice here there's no axis breaks again even though they didn't actually start at zero it's a bit hard to see when you zoom in there but that starts at about 70 or 80 on the left hand side and um, a bit hard to see without my glasses but trust me there should be axis breaks and there aren't any so that's the main problem there We've got this other problem here where we've got a legend that's been drawn in and that's really not necessary. Um, you would perhaps draw a legend if you are comparing two data sets on the same scatter plot. I personally wouldn't recommend doing that. That can become very busy and difficult to look at, very difficult to determine co correlation, for example, when you've got two sets of scatter plots on there and two different colors. So I would recommend that the better way to present two data sets would be to be doing side by side scatter plots. So once again, legend, not necessary. This one's a little bit blurry, but that's not a problem because they've actually done a fairly nice job of graphing, but they haven't got any access titles. So that one would lose about a mark. And also, this is not a true line of best fit. If you count that, there's 13 dots above the line and there's only seven below. So there's twice as many dots above as there is below. So it's not truly a scatter plot um, it's line of best fit. A better line of best fit would pass a little bit above, making sure that there was um, two, two dots at least pass through. You can see that there, it's passing through two different dots. But now we've got much more even spread of those dots on the scatter plot. So this, um, if a person had used this line of best fit to go about their business, they would have got the wrong Y intercept. Um, fairly close gradient, but it does change things quite a lot if you're trying to make predictions. So it's really important we get that line of best fit in the right spot. Now, in our next video, we're going to talk about how to find the equation of the line once we've got a line of best fit. We're also going to use that line of best fit and talk about interpolation and extrapolation. So I'll introduce those new terms and explain what they mean. And then we're going to interpret some information from the line of best fit. So all about predictions in our next video. The next video after that, we'll be looking at how to draw scatter plots on technology such as Excel and Desmos. So do stay tuned. They are coming your way very soon. Thank you so much for joining me. Do like and subscribe to the channel and that way you'll stay informed whenever I create a new video. Have a lovely day.